Okay, let's take a look at how a DSSS system enables two signals to transmit on the same part of the band at the same time without interfering with each other. And that's a very important part of spread spectrum RC systems. So what I've done here is I've drawn a little blank graph and the vertical axis here is time. So if we assume this is now, then this is going to be a little bit later. And here is a part of the 2.4 gigahertz band. If we look at this picture over here, we can see here is a typical DSSS signal and it's peak. It has a big sharp peak at the top and it spreads out towards the bottom. So what I've done is I've said, let's take a little portion of this, mainly that piece there, and represent it here. So from low to high, it's not the entire 2.4 gig band, but it's just a part of the band. And what we're going to do now is look at how spreading codes or PN codes, for, which stands for um, what is it? Uh, pseudo noise, um, how those codes enable us to share this space with other signals. Because as we well know, in the case of spread spectrum, we can do this. We can have another signal sitting right on top of our original signal and they'll both work together which seems really odd because remember the old 72 meg days, if you had someone on channel 13 and someone else turned on channel 13, then you both fell out of the sky. But with spread spectrum, they can both share the same piece of band. How does that work? Well, I'm going to show you. Let's assume we have two transmitters, a black one and a red one. Here they are, running at the same time. And they're both, in this example, using the same little piece of the band. Both sitting on top of the same piece of band. Now that may be because they're simply DSSS systems, or it may be they are constantly agile systems that have just chosen by random to use exactly the same part of the band at the same time. Just for a very, very brief instant. I put up the data that the, or the, the signal from the black transmitter, and you'll see it's basically a little black square to indicate exactly what frequency the transmitter is sending at any given time on our timeline. Now, the thing is that these transmitters can only transmit on one frequency at any given instant in time. Although this looks like it's transmitting over quite a range of frequencies, it's actually only on one frequency. This is averaged over time. And even though the time it's averaged over may be very small, these are changing at an extremely high rate. So you, they blur in to give you this nice uh, inverted funnel shaped graph. So if we look, if we speed things up really, really quickly, and we look at the, the finely grained time, we look at this instant in time and we see that the transmitter is sending on this frequency. We move forward to the next increment in time and it's transmitting on that frequency. Then it comes back here and it goes over there and it comes back here. So you can see that as time progresses, the transmitter is jumping around all over the place within this spread portion here. So that is the way that we get spreading added to the basic signal. So as you can see, if we give each of these columns a number, we can end up with a PN code, a number code that represents how far the data is basically offset from this point here. So in this case, this would be a one and that would be a three. And then we have a one again. Then we have a two. Um, oh, sorry, that one is a five and a, and a two. So this would be the PN code for this particular transmitter. It would go one, three, one, five, two, et cetera, et cetera. And that could be quite a long code. And that, makes this transmitter signal unique in the way it's spread across the band. Now, what happens with our red transmitter? Let's assume we turn on the red transmitter. And as you can see, just like the black signal, it hops around. That is to say, its frequency changes based on time. As we move along, it goes there, 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 so forth. So the PN code for the red signal might be 21425. That determines the offset from the start of this chart as to where to look for that signal, because this is important. Now, if we had a receiver that was simply looking for at the whole band all the time, then it would not know the red signal from the black signal. It would see two signals here on two different frequencies. How would it know red from black? And remember, these are tiny bits of information. They're a fraction of a bit of information. So there's no codes in them. It's just a tiny little bit of information that's either says there's a, there's a part of a one or a part of a zero there. How's it going to know which is which? Well, that's where the PN code applies to the receiver. When we fire up the black receiver, it knows the PN code. So it has a little template that it puts over the entire band like this. So what happens is the black receiver only ever sees black dots. It's not looking where the red dots are at that particular point in time. It's looking where the black dot should be. So effectively, it completely ignores the red signal. Now, what about the red transmitter? Well, that does something very similar. 
it has its own set of PN codes. So when it looks at the band, all it sees is the red stuff. It's pretty clever, isn't it? So these two are using exactly the same part of the band at pretty much the same time. Not exactly the same time as you notice because there's tiny differences in time along here. So that's how we can have two systems appearing to use the same part of the band at, a, at the same time without interfering because the receivers and the transmitters due to these PN codes are spreading the signal out and positioning the data at a different part depending on time and depending on the PN code. And so long as the PN codes are different, then they'll never clash. But sometimes, of course, we end up with a situation where there may be a clash because the PN code may be somewhat similar. For example, if we were to take this particular example and say give these two the same number here. So if we gave our red signal a PN code of three there. And remember, one manufacturer can't control the PN codes of another manufacturer, so this can quite often happen. That would mean that this red dot would disappear and it would be planted on top of the black dot. So what happens now that we've got two signals colliding here? Well, it's quite simple. If we put up our, our black PN screen, you can see that as far as the black receiver is concerned, there is a signal there, even if it is red or black, because it's looking there. It can't tell if it's red or black. It just knows there is a signal there. So what it does is, remember I said that this information here is not even one bit of information. It's actually many, bit, many, many of these little transitions make up a single bit of information. So if one or two of them get hit, it doesn't really matter because the receiver will look at it and say, on average, this was the data we got. And that's also how it, it also helps it deal with noise because noise will tend to sometimes affect what data is in those little squares. It averages things out and that's how you can get more sensitivity because it averages out the noise and leaves you with the signal. Sometimes you can get a lot of extra sensitivity doing that thanks to these PN codes and this spreading. So, of course, eventually, if enough of these little squares get clobbered by another signal, then you will lose your, your data. And you'll have, obviously, in the case of an RC model, you'll get a momentary loss of control, or it'll go to failsafe or whatever. But because, in the case of DSM-X and all the other frequency agile systems, this kind of collision is only going to be incredibly transient, very, very short, fraction, fraction of a second, you won't notice it, unless the levels are extremely high and the band is really, really congested. So that's how... Spreading codes will basically enable you to have multiple systems on the same part of the band seemingly at the same time. Now I'm sure this has irritated a lot of people who have said that's not how it works, it's like this and they could come up with an armful of mathematical calculations and reasons why this is oversimplification. But let's face it, it's already complicated enough even when I've tried to simplify it. So I'm hoping that by taking a few liberties, I've explained to you how the two transmitters and receivers can use the same part of the band at the same time without interfering. If you've got questions then feel free to ask them in the comments below this video or on the rcmodelreviews.com forums and I thank you for watching. I will see you again on RC Model Reviews.